Yes, on that note, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining me. Thank you to Molly and Emma. Um, on behalf of Powell's Books here in Portland, Oregon, uh, thank you for joining us for our virtual event. Uh, my name is Bree Hogan. I'm the sales manager at Powell City of Books here in Portland, Oregon. You can catch up with all of our virtual events by going to our calendar on powells.com. Tonight we are very happy to welcome both Molly Weisenberg and Emma Straub to discuss Molly's new book, The Fixed Stars. Molly Weisenberg is the author of two best-selling books, A Homemade Life and Delancey, as well as the James Beard award-winning blog, Orange Jet. She has written for the Washington Post, The Guardian, Savour, and Bon Appetit, and she also co-hosts the podcast, Spilled Milk. Tonight, we're celebrating her new book, The Memoir, The Fixed Stars. In writing tonight's intro, I kept coming back to Molly's own description of the book on her website. So I will use that to introduce you to this brilliant memoir. My latest book, The Fixed Stars, is a memoir about sexuality, divorce, and motherhood. I wrote it because in my mid-30s, nearly a decade into marriage and newly a mother, I lost track of who I was. I wrote because I wanted an answer. In the process, I came to find that I liked the company of questions. Joining Molly tonight is Emma Straub. Emma is the New York Times bestselling author of four novels. The most recent is All Adults Here. Her books have been published in 20 countries, and she and her husband owned Books Are Magic, an independent bookstore in Brooklyn, New York. From one independent bookstore to another, Emma, thanks for joining us. This evening's event will be a conversation between Molly and Emma, followed by a Q&A. If you have a question for either of them, please submit it using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can support Molly and Powell's by purchasing a copy of The Fixed Stars. A link to the book will be shared in the chat this evening. Please join me in welcoming Molly Weisenberg and Emma Straub. Yay! I'm going to clap for you, Molly, because that's what would be happening if we were in the store. I, I wanted to say I also have two of your books right here. Oh my God, that's cheating. You're cheating. Okay? I was already going to say nice things about you. You don't have to. I'm just I'm buying your affection now. I hope it's working. <laughs> it's working. Um, so, okay, before we start, I want to just describe um, our very quick meet cute, if I may. You can, you can alter it and tell it from your point of view if you'd like um, because you're the memoirist and I'm a fiction writer so I might make it up totally and you can tell me your side. Um, so in the before times when we did things like get on airplanes and stay in hotels and talk to people um, we were both at um, Winter Institute which is the independent booksellers like party of the year every year it's the it's our independent booksellers um annual conference and it is the best it's the best like whatever other conferences you go to winter institute is better it's the very best one and one of the things that they do there that's really fun is that they um they force like one million authors to sit at like folding card tables in like around the perimeter of like a giant ballroom in a hotel. Mm -hmm. And um, then they open the doors and it's like supermarket sweep and booksellers just like run at you and like get your galleys and it's like. And, and, and like marketing directors are standing there with signs <laughs> like, you know, this book is over there and this book is over there. It's, it, I did a lot of nervous sweating. Oh, so much sweating, so much sweating. Um, I did hug Jason Reynolds. I don't want to brag, but I just like, I just got right in there. I was like, this is my chance and I'm taking it. Um, but so I was standing I spoke here. Rebecca Solnit. That, yeah. was, that, was my, that was my big moment in that ballroom. I was like, I can do this. I can do this. Um, I, yeah, I ended up that same weekend sending Rebecca Solnit accidentally a uh, long text message that was all emoji. <laughs> which is fine, not mortifying at all. Um, not. Anyway, so I was sitting there in this big room and Molly, you like appeared out of nowhere, like this beautiful little pixie and <laughs> a thirsty pixie mm -hmm. and 
you were like, oh, this is my book. I want your book. And I was like, it was so That's fast. exactly what my voice sounds like. <laughs> and it's like you were gone before I even like understood who you were. And then I was like, oh, wait. And then when I understood it, I was like, wait, we could have had such a longer conversation, but it was like gone. And then, but then I had a copy of your book and I read it. I started reading it immediately and I read it nonstop until I finished, which I, I mean, you know, we are both the mother of small children. Like I can count on definitely one hand, the number of times that I've done that since having children and it's the best reading experience. And I just, I just loved this book so much. So since you're already here, you love Molly, just go ahead and click whatever button Powell's gives you um, to buy your copy of The Fixed Stars so you can have this reading experience. And I, I should also add that I signed some book plates and sent them to Powell's. So at least some of the books that Powell's is sending out will have signed book plates in them. So anyway, yeah, that's good. Fun. Yeah, people love, people love that. Um, Okay, so for, for those of you who don't know much about the book, I will start, I, I'll just start with, with sort of what I thought it was and then what it turned into for me. Uh -huh. And I would love to know what you thought it was and what it turned into for you. So like for, for me, when you read it, you know, it, it starts out like the, the sort of elevator pitch version of it is, you know, there's this, you know, cisgendered, like mostly heterosexual married woman who goes to jury duty and sees a woman lawyer and gets sort of infatuated. And then like the, you know, your world explodes, which makes it sound like, which makes it sound like a, like a, like a, like a romantic comedy sort of like, like, like mm -hmm. a sort of mm -hmm. yeah. romantic comedy, but, but it did like, not feel like a romantic. No, comedy. no, I, I sure bet it didn't. Um, but, but, but to me, what, what the book is at the, at its core is like a book about really loving and honoring yourself and letting yourself be whatever it is that you are and doing it in a, like a, a really thoughtful way. And, you know, simultaneously caring for and loving all the, all the people around you. Um, but it's so, it's so beautiful. So that's, that's what I think, but I would love to know, like when you started writing, like what you, what you thought you were doing and what you think you ended up doing. Um, well, when I started, so I've, I've never been, I've never been someone who, and I don't think many writers are this person, I should say. I've never been someone who knew where a story was going at the outset, even though I do write from real life. Um, I, I have never, well, I've always approached writing as a, like a tool for thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, the things that I feel compelled to write are often the things that we struggle to talk about, even with the people who are closest to us, whether that was, for me, in, in writing my first book, A Homemade Life, it felt really important to me to write down what it it's precisely what the grief over losing my dad or watching him die felt like and there weren't many people in my life that I could talk talk through that with mm -hmm. and so writing for me has always been a place where I could talk through ideas with myself that sounds very lonely but <laughs> it uh it works um a place where I could spend time with my own thoughts and in attempting to articulate them in a way that someone else might understand, I could get a handle on them myself. Mm -hmm. And so I started to write this book out of this desire to try to understand how 
something so fundamental to myself, and that would be my, my sexual orientation, could shift such that um, I wouldn't feel like I, I could recognize myself in it anymore. Um, and it, it was felt really preoccupying to me because especially as someone who, so I was born in 1978 and I grew up during the AIDS epidemic and my family was very involved in AIDS activism um, because my uncle passed away, died of AIDS when I was, um, gosh, I was not quite 10. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up knowing a lot of gay people and particularly a lot of gay men. And, and I grew up in Oklahoma, a super conservative place. And I remember learning and then telling other people that, you know, like they can't help it, they're born this way. And, and the whole LGBTQ plus rights movement has been, been based on this idea that like, you're born this way, um, yeah, that, that it is at the core of you, this foundation that doesn't shift. Mm -hmm. So I, I just was so tripped up with this thought, like, how could I be someone who has written extensively about her life, who has always written about her life as a way of understanding it, right? I thought I understood it well enough to have written about it. And yet, um, clearly, I don't feel that I was born this way, whatever this way is. And so what does that mean about me? And what does that mean about the whole idea of a self or identity? And I wanted to just um get to explore all of these things and also start to dialogue through my writing with other writers who have explored these kinds of questions in writing yeah i mean and you know that's one of the things that like that's one of the things about your book that i that i just like glommed onto immediately was like that yes it's a it, this book is a portrait of you as as a as a person who's sorting out lots of things but it's also really a portrait of you as a reader it's a portrait of you um i mean i'm not surprised to hear you say um that you sort things out by right i mean i i feel like that is true i mean that's definitely true for me and i think it's true for a lot of writers because why else would we have this job really mm -hmm. um but i think but my sense of you as a reader came through so much in this book and that like, you know, you, it's clear that that's, that was also how you were, um, you know, finding your way on this map and like saying like, you know, I, I mean, I wrote down some of the, some of the, you know, it's like, um, you know, Garth Greenwell, I mean, Fun Home, Annie Dillard, Maggie Nelson, like, Calvin Trillin, you know, I mean, there are all of these, all of these um, writers and, you know, writers of different kinds that you're, I, I mean, podcasts too, you know, like you, I, I loved that I, I felt like, um, and I don't always feel this way when I read memoirs, that like, this was a portrait of you, like, not just in your body, but also sort of in space, like that I, I mean, in thinking about the constellations in the book and the idea of constellations, I was seeing how you related to all of these other points and how all of these points related to each other, mm -hmm. um, which was so, which was so beautiful. I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit about the stars and, and like how your, how your idea of that came into this book, like whether, hold on, I want to back up just a scooch. So you said just a few minutes ago that you didn't know where this was going when you started. Is that because you didn't know which, like which part of the story, which part of your story you wanted to tell or like what, you know, which sort of relationships you wanted to really dig into? Or was it, yeah, was it, I guess my question is like, was it about the, the time frame that you wanted to cover or was it about the relationships that you wanted to dig into? 
think that, well, so the first part of the book that I wrote was, was the, was oddly enough, the opening. I feel like that, it doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> but the first thing that I wrote was the opening because I felt so like electrified by like the space that I was giving myself in my own brain to remember that jury duty episode. I, I started, um, I started working, I started writing it about a, a little, well, two and a half years after that experience. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, so fired up, like overflowing with adrenaline to like the point of discomfort <laughs> as I was writing that because I had never let myself spend so much time going back into that scene to interrogate what it was about this particular woman that, um, that that so thoroughly turned my head and 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 shifted the way I saw things mm -hmm. literally. Um, what was your question again? Well, my question was like whether oh. what it was. I guess like how you figured out what 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 portion of the story you wanted to focus on or because like obviously you know the whole thing but you can't ever fit everything into a book um nor should you uh but so how did you decide how did you decide which which buttons you really wanted to push and which ones weren't really necessary I think I could have told you from the beginning that this was going to be a book about marriage as much as it was about divorce mm -hmm. and that it was going to be about um, like where we locate sexual orientation. Like, it, is it a thing that is fixed? Is it a thing that, uh, that, that all of us can label or point to? And as time went by, the more I wrote, the more I realized that what I actually was more interested in, because the more that I wrote and the more that I did learn things, like, for example, reading the book Sexual Fluidity by Lisa Diamond, um, who did an incredible longitudinal study of, um, of, of women in terms of how they reported um, their sexual identity um, and I should say that's different from gender identity um, the more that I read and the more I began to feel confident with the idea that yeah my instinct that like I hadn't been lying to myself like I, I had known myself at every step of the way I knew I knew myself as well as I could at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so it shifted the questions for me and the themes for me such that I became much more interested in like what different philosophers have said about what the self is or the way that we construct this idea of the self. And so in that way, uh, and, and then once I had sort of made that shift, I felt like, um, of course, that was what was there all along. I think to me now it's, it's much more a book about, um, about identity and, um, and the ways in which um, identity is, is um, both a, a stable and a very unstable thing throughout our lifetimes, as it is a book about like this particular experience of sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that like, you know, the idea of the stars to just work so beautifully with that. Like what you say, um, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase you badly. Um, 
<laughs> but the, you know, the, 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 when we look up, we, we think, oh yes, that's just the way it is. And it's just going to stay like that forever. But of course it doesn't and things keep moving and what, you know, what, what changes, what moves farther apart and does it look different from here? Yeah, I, um, I was, I've never been somebody who, uh, I, I don't think of myself as someone who is like, um, an astronomer, a lot about astronomy. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, that first fall and winter after Brandon moved out, um, when I was starting to take the dog outside, you know, myself at night, uh, that had always been something that he did. And, and just that like very ordinary thing that in itself was a real marker of this change in, in my family. Yeah. Um, looking up at the sky and seeing Orion, which is mostly only visible. Well, I think it is only visible in the cold weather months in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and it swaps uh, in the summer, goes down South. Um, but looking up and watching Orion like looking for Orion each night as I took the dog out and being aware of how comforting it was to me to learn these like rules and principles about the movement of stars and, and starting to, um, starting to, to make connections between that and my own story. It, it took a while it took a while to find, uh, to, to draw that out in the book. Um, it took a while for me to, to put it into words the right way. But yeah. um, it ultimately, it meant so much to me to think that, that this thing that, um, you know, this, this element of our universe that human civilizations have looked to for as long as we have recorded history, this thing that we think of as fixed and that we, you know, um, memorize through, um, through mythology and, and, you know, these images we imagine into the sky and we plant our crops according to when certain constellations are out, that all of these stars are actually moving independently of one another based on their own intrinsic properties, mm -hmm. yeah. just like all of us are. Oh. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. You guys are going to love this book. If you haven't bought it yet, please do by clicking the button. Um, so one of the, sorry, I'm a bookseller. Um, I also want to talk to you about pacing. So I, as I said, I read this book really without stopping. And I think that the pacing um, is sort of what helped me. I don't, I, I, and I don't mean this as a as a diss to any other memoirists who are uh, here for this conversation. But, but, you know, sometimes I think that, you know, memoirists, um, I don't know, it, 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 like it, how do I say this without insulting anyone and paying you the compliment that I want to pay you? Um, I think, I'll sit here and watch. <laughs> I think that some, some memoirs are told really novelistically. And I mean, and you have lots of scenes in this book that do feel, you know, novelistic in that, in that sort of way. But I think that what moves the book so quickly is, um, is the structure and how it's these, these sort of very, like often, you know, sort of really bite-sized pieces. Um, that, that give you something that is clearly like artfully and carefully told while still, while still telling the story mostly chronologically, right? So you're still, you're still passing through like the, the entire story from point A to point Z, but, but it's told in these, in these sort of often, um, I don't know, like sequin, like squares, you know, that's how I was thinking of them that like, I mean, there are some longer scenes and then there are some really short dazzly ones. Um, and I was wondering if, if you were thinking about it, about, I want, I, yeah, I guess I just want to know about the structure as it sort of appeared to you and whether you were thinking about it 
as, um, I don't know, as connected to, to the subject. Like if it feels um, less fixed to mm -hmm. go through that way, you know what I mean? Rather than to have, sorry, this, this suddenly now that I'm saying it seems like such a very nerdy question. No, no, I love it. Okay. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I, so it's, it's interesting. I'm so glad you asked this because it felt to me, so I think that I really first, so when I started blogging, um, 16 years ago, um, I, I, did it to sort of like chain myself to the wheel and force myself to have a writing practice because I have never been a journal keeper or someone who um, I have always I have always wanted desperately to be the kind of person who just like needed to write and I'm not like for as much as I, I, I write to think I can go a very long time without writing and, and still be pretty, pretty coherent thing. <laughs> anyway, but so when I, when I, when I really kind of like started practicing writing, I was doing it in the form of a blog, right? And especially with food blogs, I learned right away how to tie things up neatly, right? Like, I need, you needed this thing, you know, I very quickly developed a sense of how long, how long, how much space I wanted to give myself to write about a given thing. I never kept track of the word count, but I would sort of know like when a story was done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that blog pacing like got like into my body. <laughs> and so when I wrote my first book, I, I couldn't break this habit of popping up at the end of each chapter and like putting a nice little bow on it. And, and then, you know, paving the way for the next thing. And, and I, in my second book, Delancey, I wanted to learn how to stay in the story longer. And so my sort of challenge in that was to, to make connections and, and let my chapters have more breathing room. And I wanted to stay in the story longer without constantly like coming up for air. Hmm. And in the end, I, um, what, what I think is that um, when it came time to start to, when I got deep enough in this book that I needed to start, or that the thoughts of structure started to, you know, to come to me, because I, I didn't know in the beginning what form it would take, I really, um, my goals were really different from those two books in that I wanted to, um, I didn't want to try to make connections where in real life the connections didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to let some of these moments or some of these thoughts stand on their own. And certainly there are places where I made connections where in real life it was not that clear. But I wanted to resist the urge to neatly connect things. And I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could stay in the story longer, like I had wanted to with my second book. But, but do that in a different way. Like, do it by letting myself get inside the story and splash around in it and record what I was finding, but not force it to be any particular shape. Mm -hmm. And over time, what I figured out is that um, I had this, well, over time what developed is I had this crazy list, I called it my list of fragments. It was 11 pages long. <laughs> and every time I would think like, um, oh, I just read this amazing thing, or wow, that was a really interesting podcast episode. I would write it. It was an item in my list of fragments. And I slowly worked my way through this list of fragments and, and wrote about each of them, um, you know, like as, a, as an individual section of the book, and then started to figure out how it worked. 
I, I don't know if that's a very good explanation, but that's, no, that, I mean that I feel like you should, you could like patent that. I think you should patent that idea and methodology. And I think you should charge people um, a, a large sum of money for them to use it. Okay. Okay. Because how to, how to license it, how to control it. <laughs> because, or, I mean, or, or you could just tell people who have come to hear you talk about your book. That's fine too. Um, but I, because I think that that's an incredible um, assignment to give yourself or to give another person, like to say like, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna read, like it's your job to read and absorb and listen to all of the things that you're interested in mm -hmm. and care about and responding to, and you're gonna take notes the way you would normally, whatever, however you would normally, whatever, you know, read to your partner or underline or fold down a page, whatever. Um, but you're gonna keep them in a list and then you're going to compile all of your thoughts about those things into something else. I mean, that is magnificent, Molly. Thank you. Well, I, so, um, I, I teach memoir writing. Um, but I, what I wanted to say is that, um, one of the things that I really love talking about with students is the idea of, um, paying attention to the questions that arise as you are, for instance, as, as you are maybe reliving a scene in your mind, or even like as you are reading or listening to a podcast. Um, I have always felt that, um, well, I, I, remember, I remember talking to a friend who's also a memoirist, a memoirist um, when she was starting to write her first book. And um, it was about, the book is called Stir. It's by Jessica Fector. She's an amazing writer. Um, and she, it was a story about having an aneurysm rupture in her brain when she was 28 and about her recovery from that. And I remember, I remember it so vividly standing in my bathroom, like talking to her on speakerphone or something while I was like clearing out drawer. I don't even know what I was doing. But anyway, I remember her saying to me, I don't, but I don't want to become that aneurysm girl. Like, I don't want that to be who I am. And my feeling when she said that was, it's so, like, I think the most interesting part of this whole endeavor that you're talking about is the fact that you don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this fact, you are going to write this book and you are going to tell this story in a certain way that is not going to make you that person. But mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting. I say this because I think it's really interesting to tune into our own internal commentary as we are, especially when we're paying attention to things that, are, that mean something to us when we're reading a book that's meaningful or listening to a podcast that resonates or having a phone conversation with a friend. Um, it's such rich territory to pay attention to what we're actually thinking about mm -hmm. and, and the questions that we have about our own behavior in that moment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, yeah, I, I, love, I love seeing the writing that results when people pay attention to to their own specific thought processes and their own specific questions. Yeah, right. Which I mean, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more question. That's like a giant paragraph on my sheet. So it will take me a minute to say it. Um, but then, so if you have questions for Molly, please add them into the Q and a little button down there. All, eight of you already have. Okay. So good job. Um, so when I'm done with this question, we'll go there. So that, um, what you just said, like, I mean, that it is, it also applies to the fixed stars, right? That like, there are like, these are questions, right? You're like, what is, you know, what, what, what am I? Like, who am I? What is a, what is a me? Um, and one of the, one of the things that I would love to hear you talk about is, is sort of writing yourself, writing your own story into a dialogue about queerness, 
which like, I, I mean, which, you know, we mentioned some of the, some of the books that are on your 11 page list now that I know. Um, but, you know, some of them you mentioned directly, like the Garth Greenwell is like front and center and the, when you open the front page. Um, but I, one of the things that I really, that I really loved and, and I was, and I want to know what, that I found endearing that I sort of identified, and I'd love to know if you agree with this sort of ass assessment, but was, it was what I read as this like self-knowledge that you didn't know everything and that you were in some ways new to new to a like a scene or a conversation that you knew enough to know had been in progress for a long long time and that you went back and like you know tried to excavate other stories and to like sort of piece together things mm -hmm. um and you know not not feeling sure like you know, either what, what like belonged to you or what you could write about or not what you could write about, but sort of what you had access to um, and what you, where you overlapped and where you didn't. Um, and one thought I had, and maybe it's because this is how I feel about it, but one sense that I got was that motherhood of all things was what was one of the things that really prepared you for that like willingness and ability to show up somewhere and to be like, I don't know everything. Here's what I do know. I need to learn. And like, you know, that it's just the, like that motherhood is, I mean, maybe I'm just projecting, but that like, I saw that as, cause you write so beautifully about parenting in this. And I, I feel like it's, I don't know that I haven't read that many books about parenting and sexuality simultaneously. And I, I guess that's my question. I want you to talk a little bit about. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when I was sitting in that courthouse on jury duty, I felt so much shame for where, for what I was thinking about, for this crush that I had. And, and uh, this shame came from all kinds of places. Um, you know, the primary one being that I was married and didn't want to, um, didn't want to be, uh, I, I, don't, I don't like the term cheating, but I, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to know myself as someone who would do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but another thing is that, um, being a mother, being a parent, despite the fact that, uh, sex and sexuality is at the very literal root <laughs> of parenthood, the reality of parenthood not only is deeply unsexy <laughs> and made me feel very unappealing as um, uh, a human uh, in terms of like romantic relationships, but it's also taboo. Um, I mean, the 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 most famous mother in the in. Civil, Western civilization is the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and so we, um, we don't, we don't like to talk about sexuality and motherhood. We sometimes talk about sexuality and, and parenthood. Um, we, we joke a lot about sexuality and fatherhood, you know, the, the, the dad who can't get any or whatever. Um, I'm so tired of that joke. Or that that storyline um because his his wife is too busy with the kids <laughs> um, anyway i think that um i really it took so much work within myself to believe that someone could find all of me desirable 
um, the fact that, that especially a, a woman who loves women or a queer person who, who loves women could find me desirable. It, it took, uh, it, it, it continues like that, that insecurity because of the fact of me as a mother still sort of dogs me at times. Um, because it is very hard to reconcile the two, mm -hmm. both philosophically and, and in everyday life. Um, and so I really, you know, this is something Maggie Nelson writes a little bit about in the Argonauts. Um, and I, I remember underlining that passage because it so spoke to the part of me that desperately wanted to like, you know, I, like I was saying earlier, I've always been interested in writing about the things that are hard to talk about with other people. So I loved that she was writing about this thing that we don't like to talk about. Um, and, and I'm really glad that I found, um, a, a way to to get to to weave that that motherhood is is as much a part of this story as you know as, as the queerness part of it yeah um because i think that becoming a mother i just remember so clearly when i was when brandon and i were separating um on the one hand feeling that uh what i was doing was that my daughter would forever no longer have her two biological parents under one roof. And that felt devastatingly sad to me. But at the same time, I wanted to be someone who she could be proud of. And to me, that means um, making hard decisions um, with as much um, respect both for others and for myself as possible. Yes, amen. Okay, there are 11 questions now and we've only got like 14 minutes. So I'm gonna, oh my gosh. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, I mean, if you wanna poke in here and see too. <laughs> Sorry, Ash is hungry. <laughs> you need to get some food. <laughs> Tell them to eat a guinea pig. Just ah, yeah. <laughs> it would solve a lot of problems. Okay. Um, okay. Here the, the, I'm going to start with this question from someone named Cheryl. Okay. Um, how did you access memories and emotions that happened years ago in a way that felt accurate to you? And how did you navigate writing about events and conversations with people you couldn't consult while writing the book? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to answer the first part first. Okay. I think this is something that, that the practice of food writing taught me because food writing is inherently very specific writing, right? We can't write generally about food and have it be uh, interesting to read, right? Like, uh, because we never, we never consume food in general. We always consume <laughs> food at a specific time with specific people, specific weather. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And so I think that the, I think that the, the, the discipline of, of, um, of practicing writing about food and the context that it inhabited helped me learn how to how to reconstruct a scene in my mind and go back and hang out in it until mm -hmm. I, until it, until it, it got clear to me. Um, you know, there, there have always been periods of time when I've done a small amount of journaling or kept notes for myself or things like that. And I did, I did start keeping some notes for myself around the time that we separated because I just needed a place to, to put some things down. But at that point I didn't, I didn't expect to write a book, but, um, but yeah, I really think that the practice of food writing, of trying to write about, trying to write, um, 
trying to do good storytelling about food taught me how to how to notice details and how to remember better. Yeah. Um, that makes so much sense. It, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> um, but you know, people have asked me like, did, did write, did, did not writing about food in this book feel different or did it feel scary? And it didn't feel different. And it felt scary of course, but not because it wasn't about food. It felt scary because it was deeply personal and really painful material. Um, but, but yeah, it, it all feels like the same process to me. And the second part of that question is really, um, it's so, so a number of, of people in the story have been made anonymous, um, and, um, there, I think I can only think of one person who, um, who is a sort of a composite of two people. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, um, I really tried with this book, I think more than any, I, I spent time thinking about this more than I have with any other project. Um, thinking about how to write about, how to write this story where my life intersects with other people's lives without speaking for them or making assumptions about them. And, um, and it, it took practice, mm -hmm. but I really, I really tried never to assume what was going on in someone's head or if I did, I would tell you that I was making this assumption. Um, and, and I also really, you know, there, there were some elements of certain characters that I left out because they never actually told me certain things about themselves. I just inferred them and, and then would sort of, um, I just, where I couldn't be sure that I could tell the story from my point of view and be accountable to that, I, I tried not to tell it. Yeah. Well, okay, so there, there are a couple of questions that sort of ask a kind of follow up -y question, which is, so I'm gonna sort of jam a couple of questions together here, which is that how do you, um, that how you decided sort of how much to share about loved ones and specifically your daughter in, in the book and you know, how, you know, sort of what the approval process or vetting process, or in the case of your child, like how you handled that mm -hmm. as a writer and a person. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I, I learned a lot through conversations, or actually I, maybe even just one conversation with my editor early in the process of writing this book. I think that, um, my thinking about how to, how much of, of my child um, to share, because it, it is something that has been evolving for me um, for all the years of her life. Because um, I've always felt very clearly that our kids don't belong to us. Um, and yet at the same time, I know that like, she can't give, consent of her own free will. And so I really tried to uh, keep to a bare minimum the degree to which um, you hear her voice in the book. I think that you only hear her speak once. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really tried to, uh, for all the writing, for all the writing that I did about motherhood, um, it was important to me that that it be um, that it not be about her. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't ever want to um, yeah, I didn't I, I wanted it to be very clear that um, even though I think this is this is often a, a, a pitfall in memoir is that it can be very myopic and navel gazing and this is about me I, I, for for the privacy of 
my child in particular, um, I, I needed to have it be about me as a mother and not about her as my child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more before I, here, I'm just gonna read this top one just cause I like it. Okay, this is an anonymous attendee says, not a question, but a grateful comment. Molly with her red lip and her neon friendship bracelet-y thing and Emma with her wine, I assume, you assume, right? And child made, I assume, you assume, right? Zoom background, both with their brilliant, vivid hair on fire, writing about sex and family and desire and parenthood and aspiration and disappointment. And then just, wow, so thank you. So. <laughs> oh, that makes me really happy. I have to tell you, I made this friendship bracelet for my daughter and she didn't want it. So I gave it to myself. I'm my own friend this summer. You earned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 forced, I forced my children to draw me these things, which are scenes from, from my book or images from my book. I um, love it. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to take a couple more questions. I know that a lot of people probably need to sign off. You may need to as well. Well, here, let's, here, let's do, okay. let's do one more and then see what, see what happens. Okay. okay. So a, a couple of people have um, just talked about how much they love your food writing and they want to know um, if you're going to do more. One person wants to know if there are recipes in the book, but I, I don't think there, there are not. There are recipes. Um, but yeah. Do you want to talk about that's yeah. Cool. Um, I, somebody asked me the other day if it was accurate to describe my blog as defunct. And I said, I would rather describe it as dormant. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to make it fully defunct. Um, although, wow, it sure seems that way. Uh, it's been a while. Um, I think that, um, so food has always been a way for me to access writing about everyday life and about the, about the way that we live. And I think that um, over time, I think I found other access points um, that, that have felt more alive to me right now. And, um, and I have to say also like not being, so I, I, um, I left Delancey in order to focus full time on this book and not being a part of the restaurant um, anymore, or at least not beyond like, you know, eating there and stopping in and saying hi frequently has also made it such that uh, it's been really nice to have kind of just like a normal relationship with food again and not be constantly analyzing it. Not that I was ever a food critic, but I was always thinking about what I was going to write about next or trying to make connections. And it feels really nice to just um, let it be part of, of how my, my part of what I write about, um, but maybe not the focus right now. So I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like where my heart is at the moment. Yeah, that's all right. And, I, you know, I like the idea of things being dormant and not defunct because then you can always wake them back up when, when you want to. I, you know, I thought about it at the beginning of the pandemic and then I was like, then I, then I quickly you know, became overwhelmed like all of us with everything. Yeah. And, um, I have to say I haven't thought about it again. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one last question, which is not on this list. Sorry, everybody. Um, and then I'm going to invite the nice people of Powell's back to say whatever they want to say. Um, but my question is what you've been reading. What do you, what oh. have you, what have you been able to read? What are you finding pleasure in reading? What's on your stack? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm so glad you asked. Um, so ever since I started writing this book, Up Through the Present, I have had such a different relationship with reading than at any other point in my life. I've always loved to read, but I have never like taken as much like visceral pleasure in the company of books. <laughs> um, anyway, so lately, actually, in the past three months or so, I have been really trying to um, make up for a lot of lost time in terms of reading a lot of Black voices. 
that I had not read before. Like I'd never read James Baldwin, despite the fact that I had three of his books on my bookshelf. <laughs> so I've now read two of them. I started with The Fire Next Time, which is incredible and feels so present. Um, and uh, even in this decades later. Um, and then I read Giovanni's Room, which was incredible. And then I've been reading more like contemporary um, Black women novelists. So I read An American Marriage, but which I meant to read like two years ago. Yeah. Um, next on my list, actually you can't see it right now, but is, um, oh my God, The Vanishing Half, right? Britt Bennett. It's so good. Yes. I love it. I'm reading that next. Um, however, I had started before the pandemic, I had started crossing to safety, Wallace Stegner. Yes. And I'd never read any Wallace Stegner before. And I'd started reading it before the pandemic and I put it down. And then I did that thing where everybody was reading War and Peace for a while. <laughs> Spelled out 800 pages in. I feel like I need to finish it. But anyway, I went back to Wallace Steg Stegner and now I'm almost done with crossing to safety. And it's it is so comforting to read about, you know, so it's about the friendship of these two couples. And it's incredibly comforting and just so beautiful and insightful and quietly brilliant. And I'm so grateful to finally be reading it. Yeah. Uh, Wait, what are you reading? Oh, Jesus. Um, I write that, so I just finished, you know, because I really, felt what you said about not being at the restaurant and therefore not having not having to engage with food in a certain way. I feel like because I have a bookstore, I engage with books in a really <laughs> strange way, which is that I really read things almost always like six months before they come out. And so I either for, I mean, I never remember when something's actually coming out. So I have a very warped sense. Um, but I, so I just read um, uh, a book called Memorial by Brian Washington. It's his first novel. He wrote a collection of stories called Lot. Um, I've heard such good things about it. It comes out, I think in, it's October or November, I'm not sure. But man, man. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an interracial gay, I mean, to call it a love story is belittling. I mean, it's, but it's a, it's a, it's a story about these two men in Houston, Texas. One is black, the other one is Japanese, and they both have really ill and cruel fathers one is dying in japan the other one's not in good shape here it's it's incredible it's incredible i've never oh I've never, i can't wait you're gonna you're gonna love it you're gonna flip okay. um, we'll all get our pre-orders in yes get your pre-order look see pals is so good they're on top of it uh they put the link right there so yeah all right pals um i don't know if you want oh here we go hello <laughs> hi <laughs> Um, thank you so much. That was such a great conversation. And I want to say on behalf of everyone who's watching and listening, uh, thank you to both of you for joining us and for all of the great book recommendations. Uh, we've put links to both Emma's book, All Adults Here, and Molly's book, The Fixed Stars, in the chat function right now. So you can hop over there right now and take a look at those links while I finish up talking. Um, again, thank you very much. This has been such a brilliant conversation and we're so blessed that you were able to join us. Congratulations, Molly, on your book publication. Emma, best wishes to you and the Books Are Magic crew uh, for the rest of this pandemic. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us. Yay. Thank Emily. you so much. Thank you, Powell. Thank you, Emma. Thank you.